Stephen Charles Clark was born in Colchester, Essex, England in 1969. His parents, Charles and Doris, had both been police officers before they had children. Victoria was the name of his younger sister. Stephen was only two years old when he was in a terrible accident. Doris had left the house to go shopping, but she didn't know that Stephen had also left the house and was following her. She didn't find out about this until she heard a commotion and saw that a truck had hit her son. It's not clear if anyone else was home that day to watch Stephen. He was in a coma for a month, which was sad, and now he has a limp and an arm that will never be the same. Even though Stephen had a hard childhood, he grew up to be funny, smart, and usually happy. He loved music, bowling, and hanging out at the local pub. He also liked to swim and was really into computers. Stephen and his sister grew up in South Africa, but in 1990, their family moved to Mars by the Sea, which is in England. Stephen went to the Rathbone Society in Redcar. This is a group that helps disabled people find jobs. He put in a lot of effort and did well in school. He even won an award for Apprentice of the Year. Even with all of his accomplishments, companies were often hesitant to give him a chance because of his disability, which sometimes made him fell down. Stephen and his father Charles liked to go to football games together, usually on Saturdays. Charles usually bought tickets for both of them, but on December 28, 1992, he told Stephen that if he wanted to go to the nearby Middlesbrough much, he would have to pay for his own ticket. He didn't say why. Doris and Charles said that it was a family joke that Stephen didn't like to pay for things with his own money. In the end, he decided not to go with his father for the game. On December 28, Charles left his house around 2 p.m. to drive the 10 miles to the stadium where Middlesbrough would play Crystal Palace. Doris and Stephen chose to go for a long walk on the nearby beach in Saltburn after he left. Doris says that Stephen told her he had to go to the bathroom as they were walking back. They stopped at a public bathroom near the prominent seaside pier, which was about three miles from their house. After her son went to the men's room, Doris went to the women's. After a few minutes later, when Doris went outside, she didn't see Stephen anywhere. She thought he was still in the bathroom, so she stood outside the door and waited for a few minutes before deciding that he must have left and started walking home without her. She went back to the Clark house because she thought she would run into him on the way. She never saw her son, and when she got home, it was empty. Strangely, Stephen was nowhere to be seen. When asked later why she didn't check on her son in the bathroom or make sure he wasn't still in there, she said, quote, he would have been terrified. He was 23, so he wasn't a kid. No one knows exactly when Charles got back from the game, but it was some time after Doris noticed that her son was missing. She told him what had happened, and the two of them went looking for him right away. Charles said in 2020, quote, I drove my car to Saltburn and screamed everywhere. We didn't hear anything for 28 years. Stephen was last seen wearing a maroon crew neck sweater, a navy blue parka with a fur-lined hood, blue denim pants, and gray sneakers. He was 6 feet 3 inches tall, had blue eyes and dark brown hair. After a search that turned up nothing, they knew it was time to call the cops. At 6 p.m. that day, they told police that Stephen was missing. Doris told them that she had seen two guys walk in with a little girl right after Stephen did. No one has ever been able to find or identify these people. In fact, no one has ever come forward to confirm that Doris and Stephen were there that day like she said they were. Still, the police didn't find anything during their search, just like the Clarks. 
there wasn't a single piece of information that could explain what happened to Stephen Clark that afternoon. In the days and weeks after Stephen went missing, there were several reports of seeing him. On the day Stephen went missing, a person who knew him put him near the Clark house at about 3.45 p.m. Two days after Stephen went missing, a woman said she saw him leaving the beach with an older guy wearing glasses from the window of her apartment. The cops didn't believe her story though. Given how far away her living room window was from where the two men were said to have been seen, it was unlikely that she would have seen Stephen well enough to be able to recognize him. No one knows if she had a pair of glasses or not. Stan Kamesh, a friend of Clark's, is said to have seen Stephen in Red Car on January 14, 1993. Red Car is less than 10 miles from Saltburn. He said he talked to Stephen, but he didn't think much of it because he didn't know that the young man had been reported missing yet. Interestingly, Stan's story changed over time. He admitted that he didn't talk to Stephen that day and that the man he saw wasn't Stephen, but just someone who looked like him. No one knows why he lied at first, and Stan has died since then. In the end, None of the reports can be confirmed, and since there were no leads or good suspects, the case quickly went cold. Stephen's glasses, cash, and watch were all left behind, along with the rest of his personal items. After he went missing, neither his bank account nor his savings account were ever touched. He never took the apprentice of the year prize money of $1,000. In 1999, a letter from someone who didn't want to be found said shocking things about what really happened to Stephen. Detective Chief Inspector Sean Page gave a description of what was inside. Quote, there is a lot of detail in the letter. The person who wrote the letter said that Stephen was dead and that they knew who killed him. The world has never seen the full contents of this letter. In fact, no one knew about the letter until 2020, when it was finally made public with a lot of parts black out. The case was quickly changed to a murder investigation that same year. The person who wrote the message made it sound like Charles and Doris had killed their son. In September 2020, the couple was caught after the Cleveland police looked into an old case. If the letter was what led to probable cause and the arrest, which it seems to have been, it's not clear why police waited so long to make an arrest. The woman who wrote the letter, no one ever found out who she was, eventually came forward, but she couldn't prove that the clerks were guilty. Doris and Charles got out of jail after posing bail. Police did a thorough forensic check on the Clark home, as well as their yard, garden, and a nearby wooded area. However, they didn't find anything that was important to the case. After 17-week probe, Doris and Charles were found not to be responsible for their son's disappearance in February 2021. In a documentary called, quote, Accused of Murdering Our Son, the Stephen Clark Story. The Clarks talk with Mark Williams Thomas, a former police officer who is now an investigative writer, about their ordeal. In the end, Williams Thomas said, quote, If Charles and Doris killed Stephen, they are the best players I've ever met. I don't think Stephen was killed. But a review in The Guardian said, quote, Even as William Thomas declares their innocence, Certain framing and editing choices subtle undermine him, allowing the film to have it both ways. Victoria Orr, Stephen Clark's sister, spoke out about her parents on the missing show after being quiet for decades. Victoria said, quote, Our family life was full of love, and Stephen and I couldn't have asked for a better childhood. Stephen going missing has been a living nightmare for all of us, she said. Victoria said 
There was no way her parents would have heard Stephen and criticized the cops for relying on the anonymous letter. The letter was even sent out to the wrong police department. The wrong name was used. It went to a different police force in Gooseboro, which is not the police force we're dealing with. So, I don't know why it was taken so seriously, but it has really hurt our family, she said. It was terrible. They were treated in a terrible way. Victoria said that the clerks were going to file an unofficial complaint against the police through their lawyer. Doris and Charles say that before Stephen went missing, he was dating a girl he met at a neighborhood pub, the Ship Inn. Charles said, quote, his date with the girl lasted about a week or ten days. He liked going to the pub in town. They were about the same age when she was there. They'd only ever met in a bar, and he hadn't been seen for days. It wasn't a real girlfriend, and he hadn't had one before. Before he came here, we live in South Africa and then near London. Neither parent thought that their son going missing had anything to do with his connection. The clerks also said that Stephen's behavior seemed normal on December 28th, and in the days leading up to it, as far as they knew, there was no family trouble or other problems. In 2022, the family said in a joint statement, quote, Living in a steady, painful state of not knowing is a terrible thing. We still hope that he'll walk through the door one day, but we know that is getting less and less likely as time goes on. Detective Mark Williams said, that this was one of the weirdest cases he had ever looked into. Detective Sean Page said that there are no active lines of inquiry right now, but that they will continue to respond to any intelligence and information that may help us find Stephen. At the time Stephen went missing, the Cleveland and North Yorkshire police said they think he was dating a girl he met at the Rathbone Society. It's not clear if this piece of information was important or not. In Stephen's case, no one else has ever been suspected except for his parents. Theories about why he disappeared include suicide, being kidnapped, being killed, or moving to start a new life, but nothing has ever been found to prove any of them. What happened to Stephen Clark, who was 23 years old, during that short period of time on the afternoon of December 28, 1992, at least for now, no one knows what the truth is.